Hello and welcome to The Stream. I'm Ahmed Shabuddin. Today, climate action through the courts as fossil fuel giants fail to deliver on climate pledges. Environmentalists are turning to litigation. But can a new crop of climate lawsuits force big oil to change its ways? We'll look at what's driving the latest wave of lawsuits aimed at holding polluters accountable for the climate emergency. And as always, you are more than welcome to be a part of today's conversation. Share your thoughts right here in our live YouTube chat. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is Nikki Reich, director of the Climate and Energy Program at the Center for International Environmental Law. In Mexico City, Astrid Puentes, an independent consultant on climate change and human rights. And in the U.S. state of Maryland, Delta Murner, lead scientist for the Science Hub for Climate Litigation at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Well, ladies, welcome to the stream. We're all very concerned, uh, whether scientists or not. And then that's why I want to start, Nikki, by kind of asking you, this seems like a global phenomenon that's accelerating this litigation. Why is that and why should people uh, be concerned and paying attention? That's absolutely right. It really is a global phenomenon. What climate litigation encompasses a really wide and rapidly growing number of cases that are being brought around the world in different countries under different legal regimes in different types of courts and tribunals. And those are cases against states and governments seeking, excuse me, governments and companies seeking to hold them accountable for their contributions to the climate crisis, for their emissions, but also seeking to compel them to act urgently to ad address the crisis and to halt climate destructive activity. And it's really important to understand this accelerating trend is, is responding, I think, to three key developments. One is just the rapidly developing and severe climate impacts that we're witnessing around the world that are affecting a growing number of people across the planet. And, mm -hmm. and a growing number of people being harmed means a growing number of, of victims or potential claimants. Second, scientific advances have made it more possible to connect those harms to their causes, chief among them fossil fuels. And third, there's a, a wide body of evidence in the public domain about what those fossil fuel companies and producers knew about the contributions of their products to the climate crisis when they knew it, mm -hmm. literally decades ago, and their failure to act on it. And so when people are harmed, they turn to the courts, particularly when leaders are, are dragging their feet. And, and when politics break down, the law can help break through. Oh, that's a lovely way of putting it and certainly helps us understand what's actually going on here. I want to dig a little deeper and ask you, Astrid, if you uh, take a look, I believe, at this tweet, uh, sorry, just let me close this out. Greenpeace International saying the wave of global climate litigation continues. Governments who refuse to take meaningful action to protect future generations must be held to account. When you try to identify, Astrid, what's happening here in terms of the increase uh, in litigation, what do you attribute it to? What, what started it? So I think complementing to what Nikki mentioned is out of frustration and the need for solutions. Uh, as we know, climate uh, negotiations internationally started in uh, more than 30 uh, 30 years ago. So the U United Nations Framework for Climate Change was signed in 92. And the first uh, document that scientists call attention internationally about climate uh, change was from the 90s. And so since then, we have been negotiating for decades, as I said. And although we have seen important mm -hmm. agreements, solutions mm -hmm. are not really uh, being uh, delivered as we need. And so people, and we all need solutions, and that's one of the things that triggered this litigation. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, it's because misinformation. On the one side, we're seeing science, independent science, we have to um, specific, uh, specify that, have showed the link between climate change and fossil fuels and other activities such as deforestation. But we're seeing governments going on different directions. And so we we need governments and corporations to advance solutions. And because we're not seeing that, that's right. what also triggered this litigation. And, and, you know, Delta, that's a perfect kind of uh, segue to you. I mean, I know that you're, as a scientist, focusing on the data. And, and I'm wondering, you know, we have this video comment from Sarah Meade, the co-director of the Climate Litigation Network in New Zealand, who talks about a 2019 pivotal lawsuit. Um, by this Dutch in environmental group, for those who don't know your agenda. Take a listen, and I, I want to ask you about the science after this. 
Climate litigation is a really powerful tool to hold those most responsible for causing the climate crisis to account in the face of a rapidly worsening climate crisis. The Urgenda climate case against the Dutch government shows what climate litigation can achieve. In a world first, the case saw the courts order the government to slash its emissions in order to protect human rights, leading to an overhaul of Dutch climate policy and also inspiring a climate litigation movement. Today, we see affected communities from all corners of the world turning to the courts to demand accountability, not just from governments, but also big polluters to protect their rights and those of future generations. So I'm curious, uh, hearing that and knowing what you've been predicting, as you can see here in this article, three predictions for the climate litigation in 2023, I I'm wondering what those predictions are and is this really based on new science? Is it just granular data? What's going on here? Yeah, so I want to take a step back because so there's a couple of things that are going on here that are important to understand. So mm -hmm. first of all, kind of with our agenda and those pieces, a lot of what's happening is just the understanding that there's scientific consensus on the causes and impacts of climate change that are being communicated now through the courts because unfortunately there have been failures for governments and corporations to adequately address climate change over the last 30 years, as folks are saying. Um, but there are really important advances that are happening as well in science. And there's two areas in particular that I think are important to mention here. Mm -hmm. So there's attribution science, and then there's climate obstruction research, which play really important roles. And I think why we see this advance in climate litigation and also give us a lot of potential for where we see some of these court cases moving in the future as well and where new cases might come from. And, and if I may, when you talk about obstruction, uh, for those who don't know, I mean, I think there was uh, new evidence, if you will, that found that Exxon uh, accurately predicted global warming dating back to the early 1970s. So it's these kind of deflection and obstructive tactics that I think, um, you know, people are trying to pinpoint and, and use to hold people accountable. I'm wondering, though, Astrid, like, you know, in the Netherlands, we talked about that case in the, in the video comment that you saw there. It's been sort of hailed as a landmark case. What can we learn from that case? And what can you share with us about other cases maybe that are happening in the global south, which is maybe not always as focused on? Right, and thank you for that <laughs> specific comment. So the Urgenda case is definitely a very important case because it was the first time, as uh, is what is, it was mentioned, that a state is obliged to uh, reduce their emissions. And even before the Urgenda case, um, in Colombia, the Constitutional Court, that is the highest court on human rights in 2016, declared that the government of, of Colombia had the obligation to protect Paramos, that is a very key ecosystem in the Andes, specifically also because the, the importance of this ecosystem for the protection of uh, the biodiversity, fresh water, and also climate. So we mm -hmm. have seen already decisions in terms of climate litigation even before Urgenda. Mm -hmm. The other case that I would like to highlight also is a decision from the Inter-American Court on Human Rights mm -hmm. in 2017 that concluded, it's an advisory opinion that basically decided what are and clarified the obligations of states in, in terms of the environment. And it was the first time worldwide where a court this high recognized that climate change actually exists. Mm -hmm. So that was important in terms of climate denial, but also that impacts climate, um, and all human rights, sorry. And that also, that decision, even though it's not mandatory, was mm -hmm. used in the Urgenda case. And so I wanted to also mention these two cases. There also, we have seen cases from mm -hmm. high, highest courts in sure. Brazil, in Mexico, advancing the recognition of climate actions. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, you know, we've talked now and outlined some of the things that are happening, some of the trends. Um, but what really stands out to me, if I may kind of bring this up to you, Nikki, is like, if you look at this right here, Shell directors personally sued over flawed climate strategy. So this is happening, um, this company, or I should say this, yeah. this organization, uh, Client Earth, saying that the oil company's plans put the company at financial risk. Now, we have also a comment from uh, the CEO of that law firm, and I would love to hear what you think about this trend, Nikki. Um, she's, let's listen to what Laura Clark had to say about it. 
Our recent lawsuit against Shell's board of directors is exciting and significant because it's the first time that corporate directors have been held personally liable for failing to manage climate risk. So we argue that the directors of Shell are failing to prepare the company for the net zero transition. And in doing so, they're risking the long term commercial viability of the company. So we're bringing this case as shareholders in the interests of the company, its shareholders and the planet. Nikki, maybe I can't yeah, ask you to speculate. Maybe it's not fair. But, but what's the defense here? I mean, how has the response been? And, and is there a defense strategy that's viable for these big oil companies? Well, I think the principal defense strategy that we've seen is the oil companies trying to reposition themselves as part of the solution rather than the critical source of the problem that they are. But before we come to that, I think that's exactly why we're seeing such an uptick in cases that are really probing greenwashing and the way in which um, using the stamp of, of net zero and, and the label of cleaner green, companies mm. are trying to dress up business as usual mm. as something that's compatible with, with the safe climate. But on this shell case in the in the UK, which I think is a really a critical harbinger of things to come, and it's a critical first attempt to personalize liability and to really send a signal to decision makers, those individuals who are making financial and economic decisions for companies, for banks, investors, uh, for retirement funds, mm -hmm. that they will be on the hook mm -hmm. uh, for downplaying climate risk and for failing to align business practices with what the science clearly shows is needed to prevent climate catastrophe. Because as Astrid said, the, there is a consensus now that climate change is clearly a human rights issue. It affects all human rights across the board. Mm. But it's not just about human rights and the environment. It also is one of the greatest threats to economic and financial stability. And so, you know, individual decision makers, if they fail to close this disconnect between mm -hmm. what companies are doing, where they're putting their money and continuing oil and gas production, uh, and what we know is needed to avoid climate catastrophe and, and the costs that come with it, are going to be facing increasing numbers of suits like this one. I predict we're going to see more investors and shareholders uh, seeking recourse to you know, call out the financial folly of locking independence on oil and gas uh, and prolonging uh, mm -hmm. the fossil era. Delta, you were going to jump and in yeah, there? If, yeah. Well, yeah, I'd love to jump in. And so, yeah, so just so we understand kind of the context, right? So Shell this year had record profits, and I believe that was around $40 billion in profits. Mm -hmm. This year was also one of the hottest on records um, and one of the costliest as far as weather damages that we saw from, mm -hmm. from any year. So we're looking at, you know, $40 billion in profits from this company, but there was data that was released from an insurance broker at the end of January that categorized over 300 and 313 billion dollars of economic loss that came from weather disasters in in last year alone. Mm -hmm. So not all of this is climate change, but it's also only one year. And then just to say kind of where some of the next steps of science is and how it can really help to inform these discussions, um, there was a study that was released last May that looked specifically at economic damage from, from climate change. So they were looking at one event. So they looked at Hurricane Sandy mm. and they were isolating their records to just look at additional economic damage from sea level rise from climate change. So Climate change is impacting mm. hurricanes in a number of different ways. So just from sea level rise mm. and just from this one storm, there is approximately $8.1 billion of additional damage that can be attributed through science, through this attribution work to climate change um, and specifically to sea level rise from climate change. Um, so I think these types of studies and as they grow and we see them more across the world, um, they really help to inform these discussions. And Astrid, I know you wanted to jump in. Go ahead. Yeah, and so uh, as you can see, I mean, this litigation brings a lot of aspects. And the element that I wanted to add also is about inequalities and justice. Mm -hmm. Because as we have seen, and both Nikki and Delta have mentioned, uh, there is a huge inequality in terms of impacts and responsibilities that we're not seeing today. So science science has uh, con also measured that about 10% of the population globally is responsible for about 50% of carbon emissions. Mm. And historically also, 
over 70% of emissions since the 1800s when scientists have, have data is linked to about 90 companies. So where we're talking about climate emergency, when we're talking about climate change, we're also talking about inequalities. And that is one of mm -hmm. the elements that I and, think is very and, important in this litigation. No, and it's certainly uh, an important part of this conversation. I want to talk about that. Just to take a step back, you know, we're talking about the global south here. We gave several examples for our audience, but Delta, in the U.S. Context, context, if I'm not mistaken, most of the cases uh, when it comes to the fossil fuel industry trying to hold them accountable are actually now about fraud, right, about deceiving the public, uh, as we've mentioned. And I just think that's interesting in the context of greenwashing, which we've covered here at the stream, but it's also interesting in terms of how long they've known sort of about their consequences and how long they've been able to deflect. So am I right in understanding, Delta, that, that in the U.S. context, a lot of these companies are no longer able to continue appealing. They're on their last round of appeals. I mean, what does that actually mean in terms of what's likely to happen in the U.S. context here? Yeah, so there's um, nearly three dozen cases that are what you're mentioning there, these fraud cases um, that are really based on disinformation and based on consumer fraud, the fact that the companies have known for more than five decades about the impacts of their products and have lied to consumers about that, um, and that those were intentional decisions to actively downplay and distort the mounting evidence of climate change from, from their products. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the, the basis of that. Um, these suits have been filed. It's been about a five-year process for a number of them, but we are seeing movement. So last year, there are two of those cases um, that did start to move forward mm -hmm. um, and moved into discovery. Mm -hmm. And we're expecting a lot more of the cases to move into <laughs> discovery this year, which is a really exciting moment for the legal cases and then also as scientists for the potential of new documentation that mm -hmm. comes out that we can further understand what the industry knew and when. Most certainly. And, and I, I, um, you know, Nikki, I know there's a lot about the, the, the role of these fossil fuel companies in misleading the, the public and downplaying sort of the climate emergency, but also deflecting, you know, forcing us mm -hmm. to be somewhat obsessed with our own carbon footprint as individuals, in a way, deflects away from these big corporations and their, their carbon footprints, right? And, and that's some of Absolutely. the subtle messaging that's there. With that said, I, you know, I want to share with you what's being discussed here on YouTube. Uh, we have, for example, <laughs> Tick Magnet asking, interesting name, can you prove oil is causing climate change beyond a reasonable doubt? Ladies, can you? Yes. Yes. Delta. Yes. <laughs> give us the, will, exactly. Yeah. Give us the one <laughs> sentence answer, or the you know, because I know you could sit here and probably give us a sermon about all the different ways in which that's true. Yeah. So I, just to be really clear, with source source attribution, one form of science, climate source attribution allows us to identify the pollutants that cause climate change mm. and allow us to go back to the source. So we can understand the contribution of fossil fuels, deforestation, agriculture, industrial processes. All of that is possible to track through to see what is happening with the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, and then we can connect that to, to various events um, that was mentioned before. So we have studies that very clearly show that you know emissions from just 90 of the largest carbon producers mm -hmm. contributed over half of the observed temperature rises or the half of the um, carbon dioxide that we see in the atmosphere, mm. nearly half of the temperature rises, a third of all sea level rise, mm. um, half of ocean acidification. And again, we can directly connect these back to, mm -hmm. to those companies. Nikki, is there anything you wanted to add? I mean, I know we talked about a couple landmark cases, but something to share. Sure. I mean, just in response to that question, you know, don't take it from from me as a lawyer, take it from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the world's preeminent climate authority um, that says quite clearly in its latest reports uh, that fossil fuels are unequivocally the primary cause of global warming. That if you look just at the past decade, I think it's something like plus or minus 86 percent of emissions, carbon dioxide emissions have come from the fossil fuel and industry sector. Um, so, that, I, that is un, undeniable and unequivocal at this point. What I do uh, want to come back to is just to say that these cases that are going on across the United States are really significant. They do involve uh, consumer fraud and deception claims around the, the pivot that companies, uh, fossil fuel companies have made from the past denial of their contribution to climate change to 
a, a rebranding of themselves as part of the solution and, and deceptive practices to call uh, fossil gas clean or green or to promote new techno fixes, right. these magical solutions that somehow make it seem like we can continue using oil and gas indefinitely into the future without the climate consequences because we have this new technology, carbon capture and storage, which is certainly not new, but it's been used to pump more oil out of the ground for decades. Mm. Um, or hydrogen, which is this you know, supposedly magical fuel uh, for the future, but is actually 99% uh, of hydrogen today is produced from fossil gas and fossil fuels. So mm -hmm. these are actually ways of prolonging our reliance on oil and gas and, for decades into the future. And, and when we try to predict you know, the next decade or the next few years in terms of climate litigation, you know, lots of these cases are driven by grassroots action, as we've said, in, in the global south, especially Astrid. And an example that I want to talk about is Vanuatu in, in the Pacific Islands. Um, if I'm not mistaken, we mentioned Netherlands, where there's a Dutch court that ruled that Shell must cut its carbon emissions. We've mentioned Australia, where a new coal a project was rejected due to emissions and human rights uh, concerns. So centering this debate, this small island, you know, what is the significance of Vanuatu? If I'm not mistaken, it also involves the International Court of Justice, which could be critical here. Uh, Astrid? Yeah, so one of the, well, the uh, new effort that you're mentioning is that Vanuatu as a state is leading with other uh, Pacific Island states. And today, literally, we're seeing European states also joining a request for the International Court of Justice in The Hague uh, to take this climate uh, climate change question and uh, analyze and conclude what are the state's obligations in regard to climate action. And this mm. is very important. It will be done through an advisory opinion where the this uh, International Court of Justice in The Hague will be able to analyze, receive uh, documentation and conclude what are the obligation of states. And it's very important, the lead for, from Guanajuato, and it's important also to say that it started with the youth from Guanajuato mm -hmm. and the Pacific Islands and calling the attention and action of the states. And now it's a global movement and now it states uh, through, like the, the procedure is through the uh, um, UN General Assembly to make that re this request to the highest court mm -hmm. internationally. It, it's certainly inspiring to see, you know, youth-driven initiative gain that much um, attention and support on the global level. Hundreds of countries, or over a hundred countries, indicating that they'd support it. Um, anything, anything to share with us about maybe limitations, some challenges moving forward? Um, I'm curious, Delta. I know, I know, from a science perspective, <clears throat> you've probably. You've probably seen how it's taken this long to get to this point. So any, any sort of challenges up ahead? Well, I guess one thing just to mention is there's an incredible need for new research in this area as well. We did a study last year that where we talked to litigators about the gaps that they see, the needs that they have for future litigation moving forward. And we identified over 100 research questions that need to be answered now to help inform these cases. So we really need the scientific community to, to mm. step up, to understand the mm. importance of the role of science in this work, to understand mm. litigation, the role that it has in climate action right now. Um, and there's a lot of resources for doing that. So I encourage if there are scientists and experts to reach out. And then I think, especially in the context with the folks we're talking to today, mm -hmm. it's critical that the scientific community and the legal community are really coming together and talking through these pieces so that there's um, strategic cases that are able to move forward. Most certainly. And if I could go ahead very quickly, we're oh, running out sorry. of time. Sure. I wanted to just lift up that I think it's that social movements are an essential part of the success of any strategy for climate justice. And that it's never going to be one in the courtroom alone. And that what's so exciting and encouraging about the accelerating pace of litigation in different jurisdictions across the world is that it is indeed supported by uh, and being generated and, and amplified by a massive climate justice movement and environmental justice movement around the world. And there are critical cases like the, the United States, those cases going through the courts in different states around the country are not just important here, but the, the laws that they are based on, consumer protection laws, are very similar to laws in other countries. So those precedents are going to be important elsewhere. But one of the key things we as advocates need to do so, is to ensure that the fight doesn't stop at the court because we need policy processes that can actually make sure justice and remedy is meted out, not just to those who can have access to the courtroom door, but to those who are most affected.
most certainly. Yeah, and addressing inequalities is key to mo strengthening mo capacity in this hour. Most exactly. certainly, and that's why we're so happy to have you, Astrid, join this conversation. Ladies, that's all the time we have for today's conversation. Thanks for being with us, and for those of you watching, see you next time.